started. I want to thank everyone for coming. It's a beautiful day out. I'm glad you're here to share it with us. So first, for starters, I got some housekeeping things I wanted to share with you. I had sent out some cards, little notifications about our museum events. On November 8th, we have the Battle of Lightning Creek. I think it was incorrectly put November 5th. So it's November 8th, and it's going to be at the Senior Center. So just want to give you that little heads up. Um, and we have um, more oral history coming up. Uh, we're going to be starting, we have a couple left in October. Um, we have Don Thorson next week, and then we have Gene Baldwin as well. Um, and then um, we're going to be starting in January, we have a series of oral histories. So look for that. I'll send out another little postcard so you have those for your schedule. So I want to introduce the lady. She, everybody knows her, Lucille. <laughs> <laughs> she has really put a lot of time into this book. I didn't realize how much work and research she has put into it. Um, but she is full of knowledge, and we are lucky to have her. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, Mike, do yes. you want to say a few words? Yes. Well, I want to thank you for uh, coming to this presentation today. Uh, this is a part of uh, the, the Weston County Museum District's uh, efforts to record uh, programs and, uh, and oral histories of, uh, uh, of individuals of Weston County. Uh, we are really privileged today to hear a presentation by Lucille about uh, Grace McDonald. Phillips, and uh, she has a book that uh, she wrote, and it's it's for sale. And if you've not gotten a copy of it, you really should uh, purchase a copy of it. As you, uh, if Lucille doesn't say it, as you hear the history of Grace McDonald, it could be the history of Lucille Dumbrell, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the things that the the two women did. I mean, it. it, it uh, it's uh, 50 or 60 years apart, but the, they're very, very similar in, in the things that they have done. So um, we have connections uh, uh, on Zoom, uh, and so there may be uh, people that uh, pop up on the screen or, or you hear a voice, but we're hoping that they're going to mute themselves. Uh, we're recording it, so there's going to be a video and audio recording that we have, and also uh, uh, the museum district is recording this also. So if you uh, <coughs> want to show this to a group or you have other members of your family that would like that, that you think that would like to hear this, it's, it will be available for other people to hear. It will also be on the Newsletter Journal's YouTube page probably starting tomorrow and you can share it from there anytime you want. Very good. Thank you, Walter. So, Lucille, I'm going to, if you would like to say some introductory remarks before we turn the, the slide on the presentation, feel free to go ahead. And well, I would like to thank you all for coming. I know you've all heard about this over and over, so you just, if you've heard it before, why, that's okay. <laughs> but anyway, I, my family is here, and I told them, I said, now, Poor Grace, she didn't have a family, but now she does. And they said, what? <laughs> but, but so I thought about that. And then I'd like to say that this is not my book. It is our book. Because so many people helped me, as I tell you about the writing and the studies that I did to write this book, you'll see the whole state of Wyoming was involved. And the State Historical <coughs> Society they came to the fore over and over again. So this is a combination of the museum, which is dear to my heart, and the, the Weston County Historical Society, which is putting it on Zoom. And Mike is such a wonderful president of our society. And uh, I'm telling you, Cindy has put in hours on the, on the PowerPoint, which would be beyond my capability, and I really appreciate all she's done. So I just wanted to, and, and I just wanted to say that I'm awfully glad elk season is over, so Doug could be here. <laughs> so anyway, with that, I will start talking about Grace McDonald Phillips, 
and I call her a legal pioneer because she was. And even though some other people thought maybe she wasn't what she said she was, <coughs> I did the research and I found out she was who she said she was in spades. She was an amazing woman in many ways. Very bright, very well educated, and very conscientious about the practice of the legal profession. She really cared about the legal profession. And if you'll look at the picture that's on the front of the book, and on, now I guess is that picture on there yet? <coughs> Not yet? Not yet. Well, there is coming a picture. And if you notice, this woman was in her uh, early 20s in this picture, although she does look older. But please notice that she has a cane. And I will tell you a little bit more about that cane when she gets to law school, because this picture was taken from her law school picture. And so the cane is very significant in her life. So anybody notice the cane? Well, then we start with my story. My story began, well, I was kind of uh, working in the historical society and different things. I thought, well, I'll take Mabel Brown's course. And she taught in the community ed. And I thought, we've been so lucky to have that community ed program here. And I have taken advantage of it several times. But none as importantly as the first time I took the course from Mabel Brown on Wyoming history. You know, Mabel always kind of emphasized history in this area, too, because she thought we'd been a little bit overlooked sometimes. But <clears throat> Mabel really found out history in this area, so I thought, well, that would be a good thing for me to do. So I took her course, and Mabel, in her infinite wisdom, she said, I want to make an assignment for all of you folks. Please look up a story that hasn't been told, preferably about Weston County and Newcastle, and write an essay for the class on this particular event. And I thought, well, maybe so. So I started looking at the old <clears throat> newspapers. And if you haven't ever seen them, they have these humongous books and <laughs> papers at the, at the museum, don't you, Cindy? And, and they, you can look in those newspapers and find information. And that's a lot easier than watching microfilm. So I was looking through the papers, and on the front page of several pa papers, I found this article, Grace McDonald, first woman attorney in Wyoming. And I thought, what? I've lived in Newcastle for 30 years. I've been married to a lawyer, and I never heard of Grace McDonald. What in the world happened? So I started to study that. I thought, well, that would be a good essay. Well, for heaven's sakes, it just got more complicated and more complicated. But I want you to know the Supreme Court of the state of Wyoming is wonderful. I think her name, what was her name? She was so great. I just called her up and she found out all kinds of information and Grace was a lawyer. She had all of that information and they generously sent the information to me because of course it was all public. I think her name was Rita White, am I right? Yep. Is that right, Doug? She was absolutely wonderful. And whenever I call, I, she'd find out some more information and, and so I would have to say that the Supreme Court of the state of Wyoming was a big part. That's why I say our, our book. And the, uh, so then uh, Judge Guthrie had told some people, he said, well, he says, I think Grace Raymond Hebert was the first lawyer, woman lawyer in the state. I said, what? I grew up with at the university and I knew all about Grace Raymond Hebert, but I never heard that she was a lawyer. I thought she was more like a historian or an economist or a secretary to the board of trustees, which is what she was. And so I started looking all that up, and this is what I found. And it's mostly in the book, but I'll just tell you that she had signed up in 1898 as the first lawyer. She put her name in. She was no more a lawyer than I am. She was, <laughs> come on in, Norma. She was no more a lawyer than I was. And, but she was a really 
enthusiastic suffragette. And she wanted, she noticed that there was no lawyer in Wyoming, so she just put her name in and they put it into the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And then later on, she decided, well, she needed more credentials than that. And there was a judge named V.J. Tidball in Wyoming, in uh, Laramie. And I remember him when I was a little girl in Laramie. I remember he was really impressive. And he wrote a letter recommending her to the Supreme Court. He wrote it and said, and this lady is so wonderful that she can do anything she wants to do. Not a word about whether she was a lawyer or not a lawyer, just that she was just, whatever she decided to do, she could do, by golly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and then they put her name down again in the Supreme Court. So there's a picture, is that a picture of Grace Lady Beaver? Mm -hmm. So I found out, no, she was not a lawyer. And then I got a book that was talking about uh, women lawyers in the, in the United States. And by golly, she was listed as the first woman lawyer in Wyoming. So I, I have a chapter in the book or a section called Setting the Record Straight. <laughs> I thought my lawyer lady deserved to be acknowledged. And in 30 years here in the legal profession, I had never heard one word about that lady practicing law. So I thought, well, she deserved to be recognized because she actually was the first woman. It was a little bit late because Wyoming, of course, gave women the right to vote and hold public office in 1869. And this was 1920. I thought, good grief, they were. I agree with Grace Raymond Hebert that they were a little slow. But anyway, so, so anyway, the next picture is a picture of Grace McDonald, who came to Newcastle. Then, <laughs> it says here that the research led to a project that lasted 40 years. Well, I would say it was sort of on and off because there was a time. You know what happens, you all know this, that uh, life is what happens when you're making other plans. <laughs> and so I had a husband who was very helpful and we went from one place to another. He actually traveled with me to these places that Grace was. And I found out more about her because of the State Historical Society. And there was a lady named Dorothy Millett who had written a book about the uh, Bighorn Basin. And there was a man in there called T.P. McDonald. Hi there. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate that effort. Good grief. I see so many old friends, I hope I can get through this without crying. <laughs> I'm going to talk about Grace, and I'll just... <laughs> uh, so anyway, you know, life happens. But anyway, we traveled, and we went to all these places because my friend Dorothy Millett in Thermopolis had found this McDonald family there. And, he, and the McDonald had come from... Uh, Billings, Montana, from Bridger City, Montana, and come down into Matitsi and Thermopolis, and she was doing that history, and as a matter of fact, her book is in our library, so I quickly, lately I got that book out and found out a lot about the family. So her family actually lived in the Bighorn Basin in her childhood. Then what happened? Well. I found out from that area and their newspapers what was going on in the Bighorn Basin. And Grace was going to school in a place called the Annie Wright Seminary in Tacoma, Washington. I found that out and uh, it was a boarding school for girls, Episcopalian. And uh, I decided that the education system in Wyoming wasn't really that great and these parents were very interested in education and in the census that's another wonderful place to look up found out that they both could read and write both her parents could read and write so they were very conscientious so they sent her to the Annie Wright school well Dick and I went to the Annie Wright school and, and there we found 
a whole bunch of information because she had written back to them on their 100th anniversary a whole story about her experience at the Annie Wright School. So there, not only did I find out she was at the Annie Wright School, but I had her own writing about the Annie Wright School, which I thought, wow, well, this is what they call primary source material. And this is the best kind of material you can have to write a book. And I was really impressed with the, the information. And then I found out from the Annie Wright School that she had graduated and had gone on to Wellesley College in Massachusetts, for heaven's sakes. Why in the world would she do that? And all of this was quite expensive. So I found another newspaper article that said that Marie McDonald was working as a bookkeeper at one of the businesses in Thermopolis. And I thought, I'm not surprised because this was expensive education that this lady was getting. And then she, it's kind of interesting, when Dick and I went to Wellesley, which we did, we visited Wellesley, it was really fun. And they said, well, you know, she was, she was from the West, and you know, well, she didn't accomplish much at Wellesley. <laughs> you know? And I found out from them that actually there was kind of an attitude, but she got through Wellesley, graduated with I don't know whether it was with honors, but at least she graduated in 1910. She had graduated from Wellesley College, which was, you know, that's not bad. That's a pretty <laughs> prestigious thing. And uh, she was really, she was really pretty smart to be able to do that. So I thought, oh, that's just wonderful. Then what in the world did she do? Well, I found out that Wellesley, the reason Wellesley was founded, and this just tickled me, Pete, was because the men had decided that all the women that were teaching their wonderful men were didn't have the education that they needed to teach the men what they needed to know, for heaven's <laughs> sake. So they founded Wellesley. And they encouraged all of their graduates to be teachers. So Grace, being a good graduate of Wellesley, she went to Tonino, Washington, and became a teacher. Well, glory be, can you imagine, I talked. I put an ad in the paper in Tonino, and the superintendent of the schools there connected me with one of her students. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. And I called him up, and his name was Lloyd Axtell, and he says, oh, he says, I remember Miss McDonald. She was a really nice person. I really liked her. But she had quite a lot of trouble teaching because she just couldn't keep things in order. She was much too nice to be a first grade teacher. <laughs> I thought that was great. And so uh, she said the principal had to come and take her class in the middle of the year. So here was Grace and she was a failure, sort of. She wasn't used to being a failure. It was hard on her, I'm sure. But she just couldn't handle those obstreperous children in those classes. So, so she, her father had come back to Seattle because the mother's family was on the West Coast. My, my editor said, well, what are you talking about the West Coast for? This is a Wyoming story. And I said, well, Marie's parents went to the West Coast. And so they kept going back there. And T.P. McDonald had lost a suit on leases in the Bighorn Basin, and he was fined $1,500. Well, I don't know how much $1,500 is in the Ironbound, even a lot more than it was at that time. And so he had gone back to Seattle, having <clears throat> to pay this big fine to the federal government for messing up all the leases. And uh, so then it came about, uh, he said, well, or I don't know how they said this. I, I couldn't read their minds at this time. Why doesn't Grace go to law school? And then I'll be able to do something about this problem I have when I'm a prospector and I'm trying to find out all this stuff. And so Grace went to law school. She went to law school in 1913 had graduated in 1916 from law school, from the University of Washington Law School. And that's why I was asking Doug, what were the classes that she took? And the Wellesley and, and the Addie Wright School wouldn't give me any grades. 
I didn't get any grades from either one of them. But the University of Washington gave me all of her courses and all of her grades. They were mostly A's and a few B's, and she took those courses that Doug said, torts and contracts and, and uh, constitution, and every single one of them was on there was either an A or a B. And she was awarded the cane by her 50 students that went, 50 men in her class and grades, and they gave her the cane because she was a good scout. And so that was why she got the cane. And she belonged to an honorary organization and she really, really distinguished herself in law school. And at that time, just to have you know the situation, there was no law school in Wyoming. There wasn't a law school in Wyoming until the year that Grace came here in 1920. And uh, Hazel Bowman Kerper was the first graduate eight years later. So, you know, she, and the University of Washington was far ahead. They had had a law school for quite a while and evidently a good law school. And then she went, what did she do then? Well, I was just digging around and there again, the Supreme Court of the state of Washington. They were wonderful. And the information you get from the Supreme Court is primary source material. And, and Dick and I were so happy. And you know, I think that he must have guided me through a lot of this Supreme Court stuff, I don't know, but you know, because he was comfortable with that kind of an approach and talking to people like that. So. And he went with me to the University of Washington. And then they took their, I don't know whether I could get that out or not. They took the pictures right off of the wall and gave them to me. There it is. There's Grace and her 50 men. <laughs> yeah, pass it around. She was, she was actually. You know, and, and so they took So now they don't have it anymore. That they sure. don't have it, no. But I'm sending them a copy of the book. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had kind of forgotten Grace. It was just terrible. Uh, By the way, there's a picture of the Andy Wright School. You got that picture? I actually would. And a couple of slides ahead. Of Where had <laughs> Did you see the Andy Wright School? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And did you see all of the white gowned graduates of the Andy Wright School? Yeah. I have that picture somewhere too. There they are. Yeah. yeah. She's, she's right in the middle, I'm pretty sure. Uh, she's a little taller than both of the gals on either side and sort of blonde. Mm -hmm. And I think that's Grace. I decided it was Grace. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And Whatever here, you say. And there's, right. and there's the Wellesley graduating class. It was a huge class. That was a big class. That was a really big class. And when we make a public records request and are told by uh, a county clerk that, that they have to retrieve it from the vault and it's going to take 30 days, that's, that absolutely should never, ever be said to anybody. Right. And why does it take however long to get the minutes put up on there so people can actually see the minutes when in today's technology, it's as quick as, you know, you, you copy it, you paste it on there and you're done. Um, it, it, it's really the, the update of our website. There's a lot of things that we and I've, I said it in the city council meeting just a couple of days ago. All of us as commissioners and city council members in the past, they have kicked these problems down the road and I can list five right off the top the good doctor and, and during COVID, dispatch, the contracts with dispatch, the costs that are incurred when it comes to these Title 25s. They have asked, the hospitals asked for solutions for these things. So anyway, she graduated from law school and she was high in her class. So she went to work. <clears throat> she went to work in Seattle with the firm Grinstead and Loeb. And there were five names on the letterhead, and she was the last one. But she had her name on the letterhead. And she worked to, for that, uh, with that firm for four years until 1920. And uh, I thought that was pretty prestigious. So not too long ago, I actually looked them up. That's still a firm in Seattle, Washington, that firm that she worked in. Can you imagine? I thought that was funny. 
So anyway, I, I kept going and I thought, well, this is going to be a pretty important subject. And this lady is real. She was real. She was a real lawyer. She was really the first lawyer in Wyoming, and Grace Raven Hebert was not. <laughs> and we needed to set the record straight. So I, I contacted the Humanities Council, and I said, hey, I'm writing this book. I, I was optimistic at the time. I said, I'm going to write a book, but I'm doing this research, and it's on the first woman to practice law in Wyoming, and, and I wonder if you'd want to give me a grant. $2,000 they gave me. <laughs> and I looked around, and here at my husband's office, these ladies had this wonderful machine. I had a little kind of portable typewriter. I was struggling, struggling, typing all this stuff up. And I said, well, what I need is one of those. Like, it's a computer, it's a word processor. Anyway, it looks better than what I'm doing. And so they gave me enough money, and, and they were expensive in that day and age, to buy this computer. And then, glory behold, Betty Jordan was teaching classes on how to, do, how to use one of those. So I took her class <laughs> and learned how to use my computer. Wasn't that fantastic? And so I kept on going with my, my research. And all of a sudden, Grace disappeared from the face of the earth. I couldn't find anything about her. I couldn't find what happened to her. Did she die? Did she what? Guess what? She got married. <laughs> I changed her name to Phillips. <laughs> and in that day and age, you did. You changed your name. Yeah. So my husband told me when we came here, he said, you have no idea what your obligations are because you're married to me. <laughs> but anyway, so she actually married a man named Walter Phillips. And, well, why did she come to Newcastle? That was the question I was asking. This whole thing is a mystery, you know. Mysteries don't necessarily have to involve murder. <laughs> but this mystery was, what happened? Why did she come to Newcastle? Well, you know, her father was a, a mineral prospector in the Bighorn Basin, and there was a humongous gusher in Osage, Wyoming in 1920. How about that? <laughs> so guess what? T.P. McDonald came to Newcastle and brought his own lawyer. <laughs> well, that wasn't too dumb, was it? That was good. So, uh, that's why I thought they came to Newcastle because, and he had encouraged her to be a lawyer, I think. And he had reasons. So what is the I, picture? I, I advanced it to the law school. I was going to move it on to Osage. Yeah, move it to Osage because that was the big, big oil well. 2,000 barrels a day. That's pretty darn good. And so they came. And there was a company that they came with called the Julius Williams Oil and Refining Company. And she was the secretary of that company. And those are, the, those are pictures of probably Osage and Newcastle at the time. And you know, later on I found out she did drive, so I wouldn't be surprised if she was driving even at that time. But she did learn how to drive. But she... Uh, she stayed in Newcastle then for four years, and the Julius Williams Oil and Refining Company went kind of kaput. But there again, I had a friend in the State Archives Department that helped me with that information and found out what had happened to the Julius Williams Company. And it was, a, even though the Julius Williams Oil and Refining Company kind of went kaput, she continued to practice, and she had an office, and I'm telling you where her office was at first in 1921, down there between the uh, hardware store and the antlers and, the, and uh, Donna's, it, that vacant lot, that's where her office was. And there was a big fire. Did you ever hear of that fire? That was, and they never built anything in that spot. And she got a lot of her stuff out, it said, and it was well covered in the newspapers. 
So she moved to another side, I think farther up. I thought it was on Summit that she moved to, but I never could find the definite uh, address of, the, of where she moved. But she continued to practice. And then, I guess what I had? It was the darndest thing that happened. In my husband's office was a wonderful lady named Marvel Howell. And Marvel was a real Marvel. She had known that woman. Oh my God, <laughs> she did. <laughs> so what a wonderful, wonderful coincidence. And so I interviewed her. <coughs> and she said, I can see her walking up the street now. <clears throat> she liked to wear blue. She had short hair or was bobbed and blonde. She always dressed very appropriately. And was a very attractive woman. <coughs> and so Marvel remembered her, and then I interviewed Minnie Howell. And then Pearl Kirk was still alive, and Valentine Kirk was one of the founders of the uh, Julius Williams Oil and Refining Company. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just talk to Pearl Kirk. Pearl was in the, in the nursing home at the time, and she was absolutely amazing. She said, yes, I remember Grace McDonald. She was my husband's lawyer, and she was a good lawyer. And you can just imagine, I mean, she was just telling it like it was. And, and he really liked her, and she did a good job. I said, well, how about Julius Williams? <laughs> wow, she said. <laughs> Julius Williams was a crook. And as far as I'm concerned, he's still a crook. <laughs> so I thought, my goodness, all this first information, this primary source information is getting really interesting. <laughs> so anyway, I kept researching and, and I told you about her education. And, but it was very strange because they only stayed here about four <coughs> years and she would join the 20th Century Club and things like that. But interesting, there's an interesting fact I didn't tell you. When she went to Wellesley, there was a friend of hers named Abby Burroughs Brooks. Well, Abby Burroughs Brooks was from Wyoming. And of course, well, Grace said she was from Alaska because her father was prospecting in Alaska at the time, too. Hi. <laughs> and so she had gone to Alaska. The family had gone to Alaska and come back and had come to Newcastle. But Abby Burroughs Brooks was in Wellesley, and she was her friend. Well, Abby Burroughs Brooks was the daughter of B.B. and Mrs. Brooks. B.B. Brooks was a former governor of Wyoming, and they were very active Republicans. But I didn't tell you that she was also a very active Republican. And the thing that was so good about her coming to, besides all these wonderful <laughs> ladies that I could interview, was the fact that Frank Wheeler Mondell was from Newcastle. Now, I'm sure any of you that are historians know who was Frank Wheeler Mondell. He was a congressman from Wyoming, one of two, and he was the big wheel in the Republican Party. I suppose you'd call him Speaker of the House now. I don't know whether they called him Speaker then. And guess what he was working on? He was working on mineral leasing laws and the and the because they had just started doing all of that type of prospecting and leasing and placer claims and all of those technical things. And he was the leader of all of that. And if you read uh, uh, the books, the history books now, they, they will recognize that Frank Mondell was one of the most important people in the Congress at that time. And she campaigned for him when he ran for governor and Kendrick beat him out big time. Kendrick was a Democrat and I thought that, that's the way Wyoming is, you never know. And so anyway, uh, but uh, Mondell was very influential in some of this law and she was a self-proclaimed 
expert in oil and gas law. That's what she wanted to do, and that's why she came to Newcastle to do it. But then everything went kaput, <laughs> like Marvel told me. Well, it wasn't a very good time in Newcastle in uh, 1924. They kind of the banks were going broke, and, and it was the oil well was kind of going down, and everything. And this all came from Marvel, and I expect I would consider that primary, first-rate information. Anything Marvel said. So anyway, uh, she uh, they left just when everything was booming. Why? She left when everything was going down. And uh, did y'all see a picture of the courthouse in Newcastle? Yeah. That yeah. But she actually practiced in that courthouse because it was built before she was here. So I was really glad to see that. And uh, so uh, there's a picture of Frank Wheeler Bondell. Did we put that one up now? Mm -hmm. He was a handsome fellow, wasn't he? <laughs> and he was also uh, the first mayor of Newcastle, in case you didn't know that. Most of you probably did, but highly regarded. But, mm -hmm. but evidently, and she campaigned for him against Kendrick, but because she was a loyal, dyed-in-the-wool Republican. We have to remember that. And she helped found the Wyoming Republican Women's, and, uh, and she and Mrs. Brooks then worked together and so when she left, when they left here, they went to Casper, Wyoming. And so, and she had changed her name to Phillips. She had met Walter Phillips in Casper, evidently, and she changed her name to Phillips. And that's why I lost her. But then the good old Wyoming Supreme Court got me up <laughs> and found out that she was in Casper. So, uh, she was admitted to the Bar Association. That's the other thing about Grace McDonald, that she was a member of the Bar. But Grace Raymond Hebert claimed to be a member of the Bar, but there wasn't even a Bar. <laughs> <laughs> and so in the book you'll find out when the Bar was established. It was after she, she uh, claimed that she was a member of the bar when there wasn't even a bar. <laughs> but, but she was very self-promoting type of person, and so we had to all realize that. So that's that's the other reason I thought this was a really important book. But anyway, she moved to Casper, and then she was married. She was married in a house in a home. But guess what? Her wedding was front page information. This is a lady that had disappeared from the face of the earth when I was in 83, when I was researching her, and yet she was on the front page. Her wedding was on the front page. Mary Tobin, who was the society columnist, wrote a long article that told everything she wore, <laughs> and she married Walter Phillips. Well, the idea. Now, there's another mystery that I never solved. I don't know whether you can solve it for me. Why? Why did she get married to Walter Phillips? True. <laughs> well, why why was her why was her wedding so important then? Because she was the only woman practicing law in the state of Wyoming. So did she ever get that distinction? She I mean, did, well, in the <laughs> <laughs> she was a, she was a rep in politics. And uh, she was in women's groups, right? Were, but isn't that correct? Yeah. When you did all your research, this other lady was supposed to have been. So did they ever yeah, retract that? Judge, yeah, no, not till I well, came. Well, keep up. fighting her for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Judge Guthrie told somebody that told me that Grace Raymond Heber was the first woman right. lawyer. Yeah. I think it's a little too late for us to print a correction. <laughs> not going to print a correction? Well, read the book. <laughs> but anyway, so, yes, yeah, she was on the front page of all the Casper papers, and actually, when uh, <coughs> when I got my niece to help me write this late after 40 years, and she did more research, and, and, and of course, you all realize that 40 years later, there were more uh, 
things available to do research, but there were <laughs> articles all over the state in Laramie and Cheyenne telling about her being the first woman. Yeah. yeah. But nobody seemed to pay any attention to it because Grace Raymond Hebert stayed in Wyoming and she insisted she was the first woman and she actually uh, put it, it was in her obituary, it was at her funeral she was listed as, no kidding, because her funeral was the year after we went to Laramie, My, we lived in Laramie, you know, when I was growing up, yeah, and she, she just kept on insisting, and so I think that might have had quite a bit to do with it. And then, of course, Grace McDonald changed her name to Phillips. And then she moved with her husband to Fort Dodge, Iowa. Fort Dodge, Iowa. Well, why in the world would she move to Fort Dodge, Iowa? They didn't have any minerals there. <laughs> Besides the fact that I really don't think she wanted to be married that much. I thought she was a lawyer, not, not a wife. <laughs> so... You are you are surprised to know that uh, the marriage was not very happy. And then guess well, do we have that correspondence with the Pilgrims? Yes, right there. Okay, the Pilgrims. That's a was a newspaper in uh, in Wellesley where they told about their graduates and what they did, and they wrote letters. Grace was faithful to the. Of degree, she wrote to Wellesley over and over again, which was another wonderful thing for me because that's more primary source material. <clears throat> and so it was just great. And when she came to Newcastle, she wrote and she said, We are on the railroad, so anytime you come through, be sure and stop and visit me. Yes, we are living in good old Wyoming, she called it. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, yeah, and that correspondence with Wellesley was invaluable. It was really wonderful. So we're still solving the mystery. <laughs> what happened to her now? She went to Fort Dodge to the Wakansa Hotel where he was the manager. So then guess what? Dick and I went to Fort Dodge. We had to. <laughs> and I was so glad Dick was with me because I thought, well, how are we going to find out about what happened to this lady and this marriage and all of this? And what about Walter? What was what, what? What's the story about Walter Phillips? And so we went to the courthouse. <clears throat> and I said, you know, I'm doing this research on this lady, and I think she married Walter Phillips. And they said, really? Mm. Well, well, that's okay. They were not helpful. So then I sent my husband. He's a lawyer. <laughs> he said, oh, you want to know about that? Oh, well, we'll look it right up for you. <laughs> so they, they responded to him, and I found out about Walter's previous marriage, and I got the documentation of all of that. And then the documentation of the fact that he was uh, only the, direct, the manager of the Wakansa Hotel for about two years, and then he wasn't listed as the director of the Wisconsin Hotel, but that's a big hotel. That was a big deal. And then all of a sudden, well, and in the meantime, when she, she, you got a picture there, I guess, of, of the Brooks's, or have we got past that? Did we have one the, slide after that one? You got the yep. married Walder hip pillows. Yes. Yeah. See, don't you just love? Is that the past? That's the Wakansa Hotel. That's the Wakansa Hotel. Okay, well, you've seen the picture of her with her hat. And that was on the front page. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was a wonderful picture, and it isn't a very good picture, but I love that. So, anyway, uh, what happened to them then? Well, this is interesting. I found out, I don't know how I found out, but that she had moved to Roswell, New Mexico. Oh, I know, I found that out from the Wyoming Supreme Court because they had uh, letters that had recommended her to the Supreme Court in New Mexico. And the letters were from Judge Raymond, 
who was a Wyoming Newcastle judge, Judge Elsley, who was a judge at the time that she moved over, and Judge Metz, who was a judge from Thermopolis and had known the family. And I've got those letters, and I just have to read you just a little bit about what they said. Of course, Judge Elsley, Marvel Howell had been his court reporter, you know, so I, I respected him tremendously. He went to the Supreme Court and died shortly after, as I understand it. Yeah, that's what happened to him. But he was very highly regarded in Newcastle, and he wrote, when he recommended her to the bar in New Mexico. And why were they interested in New Mexico? Because the Hobbs oil field was a big deal. <laughs> and so, so he, he said that she has, uh, he said that uh, she practiced in the district, Mrs. Phillip practiced in the district where I was district judge. And I am glad to certify to her excellent moral character and to her high standing among the lawyers of the bar of the time of the state of Wyoming. She is honest and connections in all of her efforts as a brilliant and has been highly successful as a lawyer in the 7th Judicial District. I am glad indeed to recommend her for admission to practice before the bar in the state of New Mexico or wherever she may apply. Everyone will find her a credit to her profession. So I do think she, she deserves this recognition. And then I, I'm going to read you just a little bit from what Judge Raymond said because he came up later in the book. We have a, a chapter about Judge Raymond. When, <clears throat> when she removed from Newcastle, she entered the practice at Casper, afterwards being married. It is my understanding that she has continued to handle legal business in Wyoming ever since her admission to the bar in this state and still has some matters. I unqualifiedly recommend her for admission to the bar of New Mexico. And Metz's was much the same, although. He, and, the, and then the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Harry Potter, also wrote a letter that's in the book. So here's a picture of Judge Elsley. And he, he has a nice place in my heart because of his Marvel loved him and thought he was great. So those were the letters that, that the Wyoming Supreme Court gave me. And then I got them also from the uh, New Mexico Supreme Court. So I would have to say that the Supreme Courts are really cooperative. Judge Ilsley signed my adoption papers. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think he was very highly regarded here in Newcastle. And to have his recommendation of her qualifications as a lawyer impressed me. And there were, again, guess what they were? They were primary source material. I was so happy with that. So then guess what she did? <laughs> she moved to Roswell, New Mexico, <clears throat> and with her mother and father. What happened to Walter? <laughs> I don't know. I really don't. I do not know. <laughs> But and, and, then, assignment. <laughs> and then we went to Roswell, Dick and I. We had to go to Roswell. And mm -hmm. there in Roswell, we couldn't stay at a whole long time because he had to come back and go to work. And so I was just a little bit, you know, wondering what in the world am I going to do? How am I going to get this? Then comes Flora, Lucille, Witherspoon. Oh my gosh. Did I ever appreciate her? She was a researcher in Roswell, and she helped me. She, she researched the courthouse. She researched the libraries, and she knew people, a lot of people. And she talked to an attorney named Richard Bean. Richard Bean said, yeah, I remember them. I was their paper boy. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about primary source material. You have to be an attorney. <laughs> so anyway, she, it was so funny because she she was just so enthusiastic. You you would have thought it was her project. She 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 kept sending me information and 
I found out a lot about the practice in Roswell. But I want to tell you just a little bit about it, but you really need to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the part, that's the part Doug helped me with, because by the time I got back to finish that all up, I think it had been gone for quite a while. But. So anyway, she did go to Roswell, and I did put my life on hold. Like I said, life happens while you're making other plans. And then I was just, you know, I had, well, I had this, all of this stuff, and, and I had given all these talks. Well, I'll we'll just show a picture of Roswell. In addition to the weekly printed version of the Newsletter Journal, we also promote our community and share important information on our award-winning website, newslj.com, and in our weekly email newsletter, Nuke Now. We also connect with readers through various social media platforms and invite you to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can even take a look at a recent meeting of the City Council, School Board, or County Commission on our YouTube channel. We do hope that you will go to newslj.com and subscribe today, and we look forward to making all of our great content available to you. But regardless of your level of support, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for doing your part to preserve a free and independent local press. There's a picture of Roswell and some of the people that she knew in Roswell. And this is the way I gave talks at that time. I didn't have this wonderful thing. I had these posters and and just, you know, we just used these posters. So I had those all stacked under the sofa. And I had two <laughs> file cabinets in the basement of information. All of this information I've been telling you about, it was all there. And I thought, and then the COVID came and we had to stay home. There wasn't much to do. And then guess what I had? After all of this time, I had T I M E. <laughs> I didn't have three children around the house. I didn't have a husband demanding meals three times a day. I didn't have I I I had the historical society still and all of that sort of thing, but I really had time. And I started looking at that information, I thought, I wonder if I could do this. <laughs> because I wasn't a book writer. So a niece of mine, her name is Christine Gillette, and you'll see her name in here. She was a big time graduate with a PhD, and she had written a book about the Dubrow family, which some of you I think have read or seen. And I thought it was so good. I just loved her book. It was just so well done, and she's such a wonderful niece and such a smart girl. And I asked her, I said, would you help me do this? Well, in the meantime, I talked to Charlene Busk. Some of you know Charlene. And she had started typing for me. I had been writing, and she had been typing. And she had a machine that she could just read into it, and it would just type it out. I thought, my word, times have changed since I had the little portable typewriter, right? And it is a wonderful world now for doing things like that. And she said, I think I'd like to help you because she, I told her the story about Grace Raymond Hebert. And she said, we need to write that book. <laughs> <laughs> In the name of women's rights. <laughs> So anyway, she, she said she'd help, and so we started out, and, and I went back to doing it. And, uh, and Flora Lucille Witherspoon kept, continued to do research in Roswell, and even though I had Miss Dick, my, Doug stepped in and helped me with the legal problems in Roswell, and it was just, it was so much fun. I just enjoyed it so much. Everybody was so sweet and so nice. And all you people are so wonderful to come and listen to me. And so this is what she did in Roswell. She had joined the Women's Club here in Newcastle. And with Mrs. B.B. Brooks, they had traveled the state for the Women's Club. And that federation was nationwide. It was started sort of as a, 
uh, suffragette type of thing for women's rights. And, and that club, by the way, is still in Newcastle. It's called the 21st Century Club now. It was a 20th Century Club when Grace and her mother belonged to it. But it's called the 21st Century Club now. And uh, it's still here. And so, you know, those things, it just tickled me pink. And uh, so she became the president of the Roswell Women's Club of New Mexico. She was the president of the Business and Professional Women's Club and founder of that club in Roswell. She was a president of the Chavez County Bar Association, which was amazing at that time. And she was a, an expert in oil and gas law. And that was what she did argue in court. Doug translated her cases for me. <laughs> You're in English. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yes, so then I found the cases, the Flora found cases in the Supreme Court, and she, she was the one that really did a lot of the research. And she just, she just continued to do it. I paid her. I want you to know, I paid her five dollars an hour to do that. <laughs> yeah, I did. So you see, I do have an investment in this. <laughs> so anyway, I found out. Not only had she uh, had she practiced law, but she was very active, and the uh, New Mexico Bar Association had asked her to do, or she had asked them, I don't know who did it, but this is what she wrote. Oil and Gas in Public Domain, and this is a story of the Teapot Dome scandal in Wyoming. And she was in Casper while the Teapot Dome scandal was gaining momentum and being talked about. and. Uh, she, so she had an interest in it, and she was always also interested in oil and gas legislation because she was a friend of Frank Mondell, who was in Congress writing that legislation. As a matter of fact, it hasn't been too long ago that I, there was an article on the front page of the Casper paper that quoted the uh, Leasing Act of 1920. And that was one of the acts that Frank Mundell was particularly interested in. And he was involved in most of that legislation in the Congress. So I thought, well, this is interesting. And I thought, maybe you'd like to just see that dissertation. She presented that. There are three parts to it. She presented it to the... New Mexico State Bar <laughs> Association. <laughs> if you want to read about oil and gas in the public domain. <laughs> so I found that, but it was on microfilm. And that's too hard to read. So I hired a typist to type it off for me wow. and got a copy of the Oil and Gas in Public Domain by Grace McDonald. And it was published in the Inland Oil Index of Wyoming. And that Inland Oil Index was Douglas and Casper publication. So after she made the presentation, why she uh, had it published in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. But the funniest part of all of that, be funny, I guess strange, was that Albert Fall, who was the Secretary of the Interior, was in the federal penitentiary in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And he had been a member of the, of the New Mexico Bar, a senator from New Mexico, a Republican, and in the uh, Secretary of Interior at the time, and was charged with, uh, what, what was it he was in, in prison for? Bribery or something like that, because they had given the leases to the Sinclair Oil Company uh, without putting it out for public bids. Mm -hmm. And so he ended up, but he was only fined something like $5,000 and he made 100000 on the whole deal. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, that's it. You better read the book. <laughs> hey, don't tell us all this stuff. <laughs> I don't need to tell you all. So anyway, that was one of the things that she did while she was in uh, 
And there's a picture of Albert Fall, I believe, right there. Yeah, yeah. right there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, he was a very distinguished person. And she was so active in the Republican Party in New Mexico. And she wrote to Wellesley, she said, Share with us. I asked Don how you can remember all this. He said, she's been doing it for 40 years. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> There's so not much left of that teapot now. No, but we've got a picture of it. It doesn't look much, much like a teapot anymore, does it? Mm -hmm. And the, there were other. Well, it's it's quite a long story because there were other there were other oil interests in that area too, and and of course Grace was pretty much interested in oil interests. Oil and gas in the public domain was her specialty. And she probably knew as much about it as anybody, having worked with Frank Mondell. So, yeah, so, and she, she also campaigned for Hoover in uh, New Mexico when she was in Roswell, and he was running against Roosevelt. And she wrote to uh, Wellesley, in one of her letters to Wellesley, that she had given a speech on a stump. <laughs> had, giving a speech on a stump is pretty good. I think. So anyway, uh, there, she died in Roswell at the age of 54 in 1942. And actually, there again, she's front page news. She was on the front page of the <laughs> newspapers, and of course, Flora sent me copies of all of that. And so, and I, so then when Rick and I were there, we went to the cemetery and found the graves. And there's one stone, it's called McDonald, and all three are buried in that one spot. TP and Marie and, and, uh, Grace. Um, and Hazel. I didn't tell you about Hazel, but Hazel was a sister that died in Montana. She was, Grace was uh, born in, in uh, Bailings, Montana, and lived in Dodge City, Montana. Father was the manager of a coal mine there. So she, so they, whether they brought Hazel's body, I doubt, but they put Hazel on the gravestone. And the first name on the stone is Grace McDonald Phillips Lawyer. Oh, <laughs> lawyer. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, then this is 40 years ago, ago now. And it's so interesting because 83 to 2 to 23, and uh, Grace was. Just a hundred years ago, she was here in Newcastle. It just, it just kind of was strange, but it, it has come to me and all of that. And so, I wrote a little thing here that I, then this I wrote, I don't know, when I first started to do this project again, and it's ca called Grace McDonald Remembering. And so I want to just read you a couple of things that I wrote about it because it was the way, and this is when I first started the project again. As an amateur historian, I believe the record of the first woman to practice law in my state needed to be recorded and published. It has been said that a biographer develops a special relationship with the subject of the biography. I can say that this is true of my relationship with Grace. She accomplished what I was not brave enough to attempt, even in 1949 when I graduated from the University of Wyoming. My husband accomplished that goal and I stood beside him. I have been, however, well aware of the life sacrifices she made for her profession. Grace, in an unhappy marriage, had no children. My husband and I raised a family with children, grandchildren, and many great-grandchildren. I presently enjoy an amazing and lovable family with members of all ages. As a part of my life, Grace, however, 
lived her life to the end with her mother and father as supporters who provided a loving family. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if you have any questions. Lucille, thank you. Okay, so you said you did this for a class. Did you ever finish your paper for the class? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. And I was, going to, I was going to bring that, and I didn't bring it because we didn't find it at the time. Because I was wondering if Mabel had to wait 40 years to give you a grade. No, I wrote, and, and I have the paper, and it's written on legal size paper in handwriting. It was all written in handwriting. I don't know if I have any of my handwriting here or not. Well, maybe. Yeah, there it is. There's the paper. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you want to look at it? That's a copy of it. So did you pass the class? <laughs> I hope so. Well, I don't think Mabel was very strict. <laughs> <coughs> you want to tell them the title of your paper? The Search for Grace McDonald. By Lucille <laughs> well, that was excellent, Lucille. Well, if you have any questions, I'll try and remember. Or read the book, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I just had a comment. Uh, visited Roswell, uh, passing through there, and always when we were traveling, we liked to go to uh, libraries and interesting places, you know, if there were museums, libraries, so forth. So went into the museum and uh, signed our names, uh, Newcastle, Wyoming. And uh, the, the lady, elderly lady behind the desk pulled it over and looked at it because it wasn't signed every day, you know, there were days of lapses and it wasn't a big place. And she said, Newcastle, Wyoming, we have something here. There was an attorney who came from up there, and it was a lady, and she helped to get a lot of the laws through here about uh, oil and gas uh, leasing and production and everything that we didn't awesome. have prior to that. So she's recognized That's an there. That's addition to the story. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you. That, that was really surprised us. <laughs> well, she, as I say, wherever she was, she made the front pages mm -hmm. of the newspapers. And so why she disappeared in Wyoming and didn't and the 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 legal profession didn't recognize her when we were here later on, I don't know. But I think it was because of this myth that was going around that Grace Raymond Hebert was the first lawyer. And I don't you know, and that that was not true. She wasn't a lawyer. But you know, at that time they were lax. They were a lot more lax about credentials and everything, but when Grace McDonald came, she had credentials forever. She was a top student in law school, had practiced for four years in Seattle in a highly regarded firm, and so she had all the credentials a lawyer could have moving to a state and coming back to good old Wyoming. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, did you did you follow up on any of the alien abduction rumors that <laughs> removed her and then placed her in Roswell, New Mexico, at the same time as the Goddard experiences? And uh, it seems the connection that uh, is a little more salacious. And <laughs> well, I guess we could go on forever. <laughs> we could go on forever, but I do think that uh, that the uh, Teapot Dome connection is kind of interesting because she did go from here to Casper and I'm sure she was well aware of that whole process when she was in Casper and uh, then later on she and it was really interesting because the Inland Oil Index said they were they had decided that they were going to just print a little summary of the of the talk because it was about the Teapot Dome and they said it was so well researched and so well done and so accurately presented that they printed the whole thing, and you saw it was three, three issues of the Inland Oil Index took printed the whole darn speech. So, Lucille, I have a question. Uh, you commented just a few minutes ago that you're an amateur historian, <laughs> and I wanted you to give a definition of a professional historian compared to your <laughs> research that you've done here. <laughs> 
Can you help, help me to understand the difference between amateur and, and professional in this case? I don't have the degrees that Grace had to be a lawyer. <laughs> My degree is in mathematics, how about that? <laughs> Maybe the degree in mathematics helps with be a research officer. I'd have to say that. Just extensive research. Could you maybe tell this group of historians about your uh, your road to the U.S. Supreme Court and the, your your contacts with the uh, Historical Society of the U.S. Supreme That's Court? That's true. Yeah, because I, and that's part of the book I didn't put in here. But she was admitted to practice in the United States Supreme Court. She had a case, and it was in oil and gas that she did argue in the Supreme Court of the United States. Mm. And so I contacted them, and they have an organization, the history of the Supreme Court and all of that. And there is a section of the book that tells you a little bit about the first woman that got admitted to practice in the Supreme Court, and that was quite a battle. But the battle had already been fought, and she just argued her case in the Supreme Court of the United States. That was pretty nice, yeah. And I, I remember that really well because Dick was admitted to practice in the Supreme Court of the United States, and I was there when that happened. And, and uh, so, you know, it, it, it was all just, that's why I guess the whole thing was in my heart mm -hmm. as well as in my mind. <laughs> Do you know where she moved her office after the... I'm not sure, down. and I asked Leonard, I said, Leonard, would you please find that out for me? And he never did. <laughs> and I didn't have it. I didn't either. But I thought it was maybe, you know where uh, Bill Coyles lived? Did you know that house? Mm -hmm. um, let's see, what can I say? On the other side of the alley, behind the service station, there's a house. I thought maybe she was in that house. Because that one that burned down, I think, was the Haynes building. Yeah. And so that was my great-grandparents, John and Laura. So Dad's grandparents had that. They were friends with Pete Kinney in, that, in the Kinney bunch that ran the Antlers. And great-grandma and grandpa had that. Grandpa built that Haynes building, which was in that parking lot where Donna's was. Yeah, and that's and so that's, I know there's some was. office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was her office at first. But I was interested that she didn't let that deter her or the fiasco with uh, Julius Williams Oil and Refining Company didn't stop her from practicing because she had 17 cases that I found in the, in our courthouse. And it was interesting too, I got up there to find those cases just before they moved everything to Cheyenne. I thought, oh, wow. And she made one of the cases that she, uh, got about ninety dollars for <laughs> judgment, <laughs> and, and, and the cases are all in the book. So, and the people that you know, all of those names that you know would have been her, her, her uh, clients. Thanks for that. For asking, if you find out, let me know, will you? <laughs> you never found out where Walter went then, huh? Walter, well, that's another. Yeah, I have a. It tells about where he died in the book, but uh, actually, the paper boy said that there was a man that came and went sometimes from the from the house. It was somebody he didn't know, but and I guess you, you probably want to know this. I I had to leave something out. <laughs> Need a sequel. Read the book. Just leave it at that. But anyway, she did divorce him. And why she wanted to be Mrs. Phillips, I think that was a sign of the times, don't you? Mm -hmm. I think it was a sign of the times that, that she felt more comfortable being Mrs. Phillips than Miss McDonald. Mm -hmm. Because she kept that name even though she didn't keep the husband. But she didn't get a divorce until 1935. And, well, I, he had gotten a divorce in, from his first wife. And the charge was adultery, and evidently that was the only charge there was in that day and age, because that's what she charged, too, in 1935 when she got a divorce from Walter. And why she, how long had she been married? That was 35, and she was married in 24. So that was 11 years she stayed married to him, and, and he was living somewhere else. And uh, we did find his grave. 
that's another thing that's really good now. Mm -hmm. You can find a grave on the on the internet. Yes, you that's know, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful source, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, it was a different it was a different uh, investigation forty years later, and then uh, you know. Christine was very competent at finding things on the internet too, and she found all of those articles about Grace in all these different towns. <coughs> she went to Gillette, she was in Casper and Cheyenne and Laramie in the newspapers all over. But she got lost. <laughs> well, I'm glad you found her. I were thinking, well, I'll have to tell you, I'll tell you Debbie's reaction. Not Grace McDonald again, Mother. <laughs> Forty years, are you kidding me? Forty years we've been hearing about this. That's why she knows it so well, Debbie. So, you know, today I told Debbie, I said, and now Grace has a family. She said, what? I said, really? I don't know that I have a for my family. <laughs> daughter's point of view. Did, did that answer your question, Doug? <clears throat> if you want to read about the lady that was the first one admitted to practice in the United States Supreme Court, it's in the book. I thought it was just too good to leave out. I think that, you know, when you think about mom writing this book, my mother was, you know, pretty amazing person, still is, but when she was in school and in college and at the university, wow, yes. she was an outstanding student. She was, you know, top of her class. She was a total overachiever, always has been all of her life, and had opportunities to maybe do all kinds of things, like maybe even go to Oxford, that sort of thing. And um, she had an aunt who was a single woman who lived in San Francisco and had left her, her family in Utah and gone to San Francisco and made a life. And she told my mother, she said, you find one of those nice university boys and get married. <laughs> now, um, she happened to find one of the nicest university boys, and she got really lucky. And for the day and age that she was here, raising a family, being part of this community, she had a, a tremendous amount of support and freedom, being married to my dad, who was a person who wanted her to be happy. And if it made her happy, it made him happy. And the only thing she had to do to make him really happy was have children. <laughs> That's what he wanted, children. But the two of them had a remarkable marriage for a really long time, supported each other. She had, in some ways, a parallel life to Grace McDonald's. And I think this book was an adventure for her to find out what her life might have been like had she not. Mm -hmm. And if she had taken those opportunities and pursued a career um, in a different way. But but you don't stop her because this is the kind of stuff she comes up with oh, to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you're wondering if she ever accomplished anything before besides raising children. <laughs> yes, quite a bit. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, and we were probably the disappointment of her life. <laughs> we're, we're a little flawed. We're sort of like regular people and make mistakes and all that sort of stuff. We're not perfect. However, perfection is always her goal. And unfortunately, she had three imperfect children. But she's quite an amazing woman. We're not listening to her. Debbie, I, I want you and Doug to get up there, and I want a picture of the three. Okay, we'll do that. Well, it was really, I asked Doug, can I tell this story? And he, no, I told you not want to. Don't tell this story. But when Doug was in seventh grade, I don't know what I was doing, but I was on the stage at, at the school, and I introduced myself as Doug's mother. I said, you all know Doug, and I'm his mother. And afterwards, he came up to me and he said, Mother, you really did it this time. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did I do? What? You said you were my mother right in front of the whole school. <laughs> How do you feel about that now, Doug? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, uh, there's another one, though, that when you'll understand, because when we were playing football after you left, I was the quarterback, and it was a it, sort of a dangerous situation to be in. And I said, Mom, at some point in time, I'm going to get knocked down on the field, and I won't be able to get up. 
if I move my leg like this, don't run out on the field. <laughs> Thank you.